Uh, today, I will tell you about KLM. Do you know what it is? Besides a company that flies planes in the Netherlands. Um, KLM stands for Keystroke Level Modeling. This is an approach, yeah? Uh, I have a question just to be sure. Uh -huh. Today we are doing the information security? No, 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 the other thing. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry I did not announce that. But we usually have them on an uh, alternating basis. And the last thing I remember we did was something related to security. Um, so using this technique, you can quantify how much effort is necessary to use a specific interface. So a number of people thought about interfaces and how people interact with them. And they agreed that the time it takes to use the whole interface um, when you complete a specific process. So total time for the entire process is the sum of all the slices of time necessary for each sub-step in this process. This was a major achievement in science, as you can see. So uh, the total time is the sum of the sub-times. Yeah, it's obvious. Uh, sum of parts, let's put it this way. And when you interact with an interface, it boils down to a number of primitive operations, such as, and you tell me what those basic operations are. Imagine that you are using a computer, a desktop computer, and you need to write an email. What kind of things you will do to make it happen? Okay, so you move the mouse. Wait, wait, wait. So you move the mouse. What else do you do? You click. Uh, you press keys. What else? You observe. Mm -hmm. So you observe. What else? When you write, you press keys. Exactly, because you know buttons don't press themselves. Uh, so I will write mental activity as think. Anything else? You might read. It's observe and think. Um, so when you use the mouse, you have one hand always on the mouse and another hand always on the keyboard? Or maybe the other way around? So when you use the mouse, one hand has to be on the mouse. And when you don't use the mouse, what does the other hand usually do? 
I mean, the hand which was using the mouse. Yeah, I will rephrase this question because I realize there are certain interpretations that when you couple that with a website and fast internet connections, so I take it back, I'm sorry. Uh, when you type, let's just say you're a skilled typist and you use both hands. But when you want to use the mouse to point to some object, you have to take one of these two hands and, and move the mouse. So there is a process of switching the hand from one input device to the other. Uh, so I'm going to write as switch and you know what this is about. So according to the keystroke level model, uh, what you just told me is it makes sense and it's right, uh, but I will write down the mapping of um, this to the terms they actually used in, the, in their publication. So one operation is keying, when you press on a key and we will from now on mark it with a K. Another one is pointing, when you use the mouse to move the cursor to a widget or to some place on the screen. Another operation, we will mark it with an H. It's homing. It's the, the process of moving the hand from one input device to the other one. So you home it from one place to the other. And of course, M stands for mental activity, exactly as you described. Uh, so let's see, yeah, and there is of course R, a person's reaction to what just happened. Now the next thing they did after uh, taking any operation that you do with an interface and breaking it down into small components and making a list of them, they did some measurements. They measured the average time needed to do this, 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 and that. And um, let's harvest some of your feedback first. Which of these operations do you think takes the longest time. Mental. So we have one vote for mental. Pointing. Someone says pointing. Homing. And as someone has already pointed out, Vim doesn't use uh, pointing or homing, so you're on the keyboard. One thing we have observed, if we paid attention, is that no one said that keying is the longest one. Is it true? Or did someone say, and I didn't hear it? Uh, he raised his hand first. Mm -hmm. So how familiar you are with this thing? Your opinion? Vim. Yeah. Because King, if, if, if we think about King like just pressing one key, it mm -hmm. will do it very fast. And also King may depend on people. Uh, some uh, experienced typists can do it really fast, so it doesn't take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Waiting time for, for the response of the system. 
your reaction to the system's action. Uh, I was about to say that you were right. It's person specific. For example, if you have a very skilled typist, they can write, uh, let's say, 500 words per minute. I don't know if that's a lot or, or not much. Or, okay, 500 char characters per. Ah. Anyway, so let's say one person does X words per minute, and someone else does. So if X is here, somebody can be on this side of the spectrum, somebody else can be there, and perhaps it can have this you know, Gauss distribution. Someone, a lot of people have this average typing speed, a few people are really, really slow, and the other ones are really, really fast. Uh, and the same applies to how fast they point on the screen, how fast they can move the hand from one device to the other. So. Um, what this model tells us is a relative measure of the time it takes. So it's, it's relative, it's not absolute. And when I say that, I mean if we were looking at the person who does this, for them it will take, for example, 40 seconds. And if we do uh, the same measurements for another person, someone on this end of the spectrum, it will take uh, 60 seconds for them to complete the same task. However, uh, if we developed one interface, we did some measurements for this person the, and we ended up with 40 seconds, then if we improve the interface and we get, let's say, an improvement of five seconds relative to the same person, we can say, we will have another five second improvement relative to this person. Or we can measure these five seconds as a percentage and then subtract the same percentage from here rather than take the five seconds out. So the point is that with key stroke level modeling, we can make some measurements and quantify the time it takes for a given person to use the interface to complete a task. And then if we somehow improve that interface, uh, we can see how much longer or how much less time it takes for the same person to do the same thing, but in these new circumstances. So that's why it's relative. Is it clear why it's relative? Because maybe my explanation was too convoluted and I don't hear anyone saying yes. yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's still legal to say no if it's not clear, and I will explain again. But uh, actually, if we do this further, there will be some examples, and then it will be clear. Um, so the next thing they did is they made some uh, measurements for people here, here, and there. They computed an average value and uh, I will take the data from the book. So keying is worth 0.2 seconds. That's how long it takes to press a key. Pointing is 1.1 seconds. Homing is 0 0.4 seconds. The mental activity of thinking about my next action is 1.35 seconds. And the system's reaction depends on the system. If you have a really long process, like defragmenting a hard drive, for example, it will take a day. If it's a matter of sending an email, you clicked, and in a few seconds you see a little pop-up saying message sent successfully. So this reaction 
refers to how fast the system reacts, not the human. But it's still a part of the whole calculation because, um, for example, if you have the task of finding an email in an email archive of your mail client, um, the person will have to point to some edit, edit box, type a few keywords they are interested in, then they will press enter to begin searching, and then it depends on the system how fast it can find uh, that email. It can take a minute, it can take a second, but this time will be computed as a part of the whole time necessary to complete the task. Uh, and as you said, um, a person thinking about what they saw, we include that in this part. Uh, I was uh, questioning about uh, the system responding to the operation. Uh -huh. Well, in that case, this is the R uh, we were talking about. The reaction of the system, not of the person. Yeah. Reaction. So the system's reaction. Uh, so these measurements were obtained with some statistical methods. We can rely on them to make uh, relative judgments about how fast or not so fast a system is. Um, I will make a few additional remarks. Uh, the first one is that at the time this model was designed and created, uh, they were using so-called GID, graphical input device, which could be a mouse, but it could also be something else. For example, a track point, a touchpad, a joystick, it could be a trackball, and maybe something else, um, like a Wii Chuck from Nintendo Wii. One of those things that you can move in 3D. And, and I think that their calculations of uh, related to homing were targeting a mouse. Because for example, if you use a, a track point on a, on a typical laptop, it's usually, so if this is the keyboard, the track point is somewhere in the middle. And one of the reasons I prefer using the track point is because the homing time is reduced. So if you keep your hands like this, ah. if you keep your hands like this, uh, you can move just a finger and you are on the GID. But if you use a mouse, then you have to really exert greater physical effort to move your hand from here to here, or if you're left-handed, that way. And the touchpad, which is usually below the keyboard, it's, it's closer to the keyboard than the mouse is, but it's, this distance is larger than between the trackpad and the keyboard. So that's why you have to realize that uh, homing, which is here computed as 0.4 seconds, it is a function of which of these input devices you're actually using. It could be greater or smaller. Then this part of pointing one remark, question. yeah. Um, when using a pointing device, also need to click somehow. Uh, does this device also allow you to click? Or you just mm -hmm. to still have to use to make some additional movements in order to press the uh -huh. click so button. I got it. Uh, clicking 
is the same as pressing a key because you have a finger and you press on a button on the device. But let me double check. Yeah, it's the same as keying. No, because I meant when using a pointing device, mm -hmm. uh, does it allow the pointing device to click on it, or you still have to make a movement in your of your hand to go to the ah. buttons? Okay, so let's say we are using a mouse, which has one button. Yeah. To keep it simple, uh, you you homed from the keyboard to the mouse, you pointed it, and then you pressed. Yeah. So this button press is the same as pressing a key, keying. Oh. Uh, so let's get back to pointing. It takes 1.1 seconds to, to do this on average with a mouse. But if you use another device, for example, a track point, for some people, it might be more complicated. And as an example, uh, did anyone ever try to play a 3D shooter with anything but a mouse? A touchpad, for example. Did anyone play Quake with a touchpad or a track point? It's impossible. <laughs> Someone is going to beat you. Yeah. You tried it. Yes, I have such case. I was playing some online shooter and, mm -hmm. uh, and my keyboard uh, stopped working. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you had to fall back to, to alternative input devices. I have to finish my quest. <laughs> my quest and uh, uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. So again, this implies that um, what we computed here, or what they computed here, is subject to some variation, depending on which graphical input device you are playing with. Uh, and shooter games are not the only example. Uh, for instance, who uses Inkscape or GIMP or Photoshop to create either vector graphics or raster graphics? Anyone? No one? I just use GIMP to make crop. some crop cuts. Crop. So to, to okay, to it. crop some pics. <laughs> so, um, if you use such uh, software to draw some illustrations, then a lot of people prefer to use the mouse uh, and it's much more complicated to do the same uh, with the track point. And the reason, or at least one of the reasons, is because, um, okay, let me find an example. Let's say you want to draw a curve like this one. Uh, you can configure your mouse in such a way that well, actually, you can do the same with a track point, but let me go ahead. So um, you can configure the mouse such that a long move on the physical space is mapped to a very short distance on the virtual space, virtual uh, coordinate system. In other words, uh, if I move the mouse from one corner of the screen to the other, uh, from one corner of the touch of the mouse pad to the other, it won't be the equivalent of moving the, the cursor from one corner to the other. It will move it only, let's say, this way. So the point is that I can precisely tune the motion of the cursor on the screen. Whereas with a device like a track point, it might be more difficult to achieve the same because you only have one finger to control it. While here you can use the entire arm to move the device. But on the other hand, if you think about effort, with a mouse you have to move the whole arm, but with a track point you can just use one finger. 
and you don't have to always move it. You can just keep uh, pushing the track point in one direction, and it keeps going. You don't have to always move it, as is the case in, in with the mouse. So now that I've I've told you about each of these operations, there are several things you need to know in order to be able to apply the keystroke level model in your project. And for that, um, I will give you a list of rules. I don't remember them in the exact uh, order, but I still remember them. So, let's say I'm typing the word hello. This can be seen as the sum of um, keying. So, one, two, three, four, five. I have to press five keys, right? So that's K, 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 one, two, three, four, five. You can already do some primitive cal calculations such as 0.2 multiplied by five gives you that many seconds. So that's how long it will take me to type the word hello. However, um, you don't just type it like that. Normally, you have to think before you press each key. So there is a mental operation ahead of each keying operation. Now, one of the rules says that if you have such a sequence in which all of the keying operations are related to the same uh, entity, logical entity, then you can get rid of all the mental operations except the one in the beginning. Now, to illustrate that in a simple example, when I want to type hello, I think only in the beginning, and then all those five keystrokes are performed with muscle memory more than they are performed with uh, you know, high level cognitive skills. So that's why to type this one logical unit, I only need one mental operations. All the other keystrokes, we consider those as a part of this calculation because as a part of this mental calculation because the moment my fingers are on the keyboard, I don't have to consciously think about what I'm going to press next. All of that's a result of muscle memory in, in action. So the first rule is um, what I just told you. When you have, um, so one, mental operation per logical unit. In this case, um, hello, we don't treat it as a sequence of uh, five, five characters. We treat it as a string, as a word. And it makes sense because uh, when you speak, you don't consciously think about each letter in every word you are pronouncing, right? You thought of the word and then it just goes. Um, however, let's say uh, that you have to type a command in an interface. Mm. 
one instance of that is when you use the sleep command inside a bash script, for example, to tell it to, to wait for a while. Or if you're just uh, typing this in the terminal. The second, so you type this, then there is a space, and then you give it an argument to this thing, which indicates the number of seconds. Let's say I want my system to do nothing for 10 seconds. So in this case, sleep is again one, two, three, four, five characters. So that's one mental operation followed by one, two, three, four, five keying operations. This 10, it's not just a matter of um, pressing two buttons on the keyboard. Because this thing is an argument of this entity. It requires an, a mental operation on its own. Now let me illustrate that in a contrast. If I wanted to write sleep 10 as if it were a word, then there would be only one mental operation for this whole typing exercise. But in this case, we have two logical units. One of them is the command. The other one is the argument for that command. So in the case of the argument, we do need another mental operation. And of course, Pressing space is uh, another keying action on its own. However, so let me say that um, use ah. so there is one mental operation. per argument. Another rule we can apply uh, I don't remember the exact term they were using but let's say it's um, so Again, I will give you the example and then perhaps you can help me uh, choose the right words for it. Let's say I am only uh, typing one command, which is, for example, uptime. If you do this, it will tell you how, for how long this uh, a given system was running. How many, so help me break it down into primitive operations. I'll start with the first one, which is the mental operation of thinking about what I'm going to type. What happens next? One, two, three, four, five, six case. One, two, three, four, five, six case. So if I do that, will my computer tell me it's uptime? No. no, because I have to type enter. So there is another K here for pressing enter, for submitting my input to the system. Now I'm going to ask you, should there be an M before the last K? Yes. Why? Because it's not already predefined that you are going to press enter. You can change your mind at some point, so you actually, it's once again an unconscious thing you have to decide. Mm -hmm. But, well, according to what they figured out when they developed this model, is that you don't need this, because this M is actually a part of this one. You know that this command doesn't require any arguments. So when you started typing it, you already knew that at the end you will press enter because there is nothing else to say. So, um, this brings us to another rule 
which is um, when there is one of these delimiters like enter or a period at the end of the sentence you don't have to have a separate mental operation for it so no M for delimiters but let me check if that's exactly the term they are using Ah, it's not a delimiter, it's a terminator, which makes sense. Because the reason this rule is applied is because of habituation. When you begin to learn how to use a system, then of course there is a mental operation ahead of any single action you perform. But at some point you become trained. You, you are so accustomed to using the system that um, you know pressing enter to make a new line becomes, or let's say if you're uh, using a, an instant messenger, for some of these programs, when you press enter, it doesn't give you a backslash n, it actually sends the message. And you get used to this, that's what this term describes. And because you are used to this, it doesn't require a separate mental effort to to perform this operation of adding a terminator to the end of your command. Uh, there is another rule which says the following. And before I write it down here, let me give you an example. Let's say I am using the mouse to point my cursor to an icon and then press that icon. So it looks like this, I think. And let's assume that my hand is already on the mouse. So there is no homing operation in that. So I think I point, then I think again, and then I click. Well, the rule says that you can get rid of this mental operation because while the mouse is on its way to the destination, you can perform this final click automatically, so to speak. It's like you have this hardware accelerated uh, functionality in your brain. A bunch of neurons specifically dedicated to allowing you to click really fast. So uh, basically you can express that as a PMK becomes a PK. So this mental operation um, doesn't have to be there because pointing and clicking can be treated as one entire unit, not as two separate units. We still keep them here separately because P costs 1.1 seconds and the K costs 0.2 seconds. So this will be a total of 1.3. 
so do you agree with this rule? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. um, I will make some space. Uh -huh. We have space here. And the next step is for us to go through a practical exercise. I will describe one scenario, and then all of you will have to, <laughs> will have to come up with a sketch on paper which solves this problem. Then we will use the keystroke level model to quantify uh, the interface proposed by some of you, then we will compare them and see which of them is the fastest one. And then we will think about it some more and see if there is something we can do to further improve it. Uh, and before I I do that, I will tell you about this source that I'm relying on. I mentioned it in the past. It's a book called The Humane Interface, written by Jeff Raskin. And it has a lot of pictures. So perhaps some of that will attract you. So we have one, two, three, four rules, and here I see a few additional ones which I didn't list, so let me tell you what they are. Uh, You're listening, right? So one additional rule is uh, the deletion of overlapped M's. And to explain what this is about, let's say you have process. Let's look at this timeline. You gave some input to the computer. Now the computer is thinking, so this is an R. When the computer gave you the result, you thought about it. Um, and then continued your actions. So what the rule says is that in, in such a situation, you can drop the M because you can think while the computer is thinking. So that's another rule. And uh, I brought this up in the past, but it's probably a good idea to say that again. Uh, when we think about reactions, Was it a ringtone or was it someone dropping? No. Sounds like, an, like a nice ringtone. Uh, 250 milliseconds seems to be the threshold beyond which a person thinks the system either didn't accept its input, the system failed, or something went wrong in some other way. Therefore, if you know that a long running process will take, well, if you know that a process will take more than 250 milliseconds, what should you do in your interface? Display something. So you need to show a progress bar. 
either a progress bar or just a progress indicator. If it's a really long running process, sometimes you know exactly how long it will take. For instance, if you're downloading a 10 megabyte file at a speed of uh, five kilobytes per second, you can divide that by this and get the seconds out. So you can draw a progress bar that moves that many pixels per second. But if it's a process you cannot estimate, then in that case, you can just show a spinning wheel or a moving bar that goes to the left, to the right, and then on and on for as long as the process is in progress. If you don't do that, a person will most likely click again, giving you the same input, or they will just get frustrated because this program sucks. Uh, let's see what was the other rule that I missed. Mm -hmm. This one I did bring up as a part of another rule, not as a separate one. Mm -hmm. So remember that here we had space as a delimiter. And one could say that we should have another mental operation here before you press space, you have to think about it. But this space, again, if we rely on habituation, you know that after every command you have to type a delimiter, so this M isn't necessary. And the same rule would apply if you had multiple arguments. Let's say slip 10, space 20 whatever that would whatever that would mean again for this delimiter you wouldn't have to have a, an independent mental operation so uh, these are the primitive steps that make one long task these are the rules you can apply to to simplify your calculations and now let's switch to the exercise itself. I'm going to read it first. You can take some notes. Then I, I will try to summarize it on the, um, on the board. So the requirements are as follows. Uh, there is one person working at a computer typing reports. Occasionally they are interrupted by a colleague and asked to convert a temperature from Fahrenheit to Celsius degrees or vice versa. For example, the person might be asked, please convert 302.25 degrees from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Uh, the person then has to use the keyboard and the GID, the graphical input device, to enter the temperature provided um, other methods of input, such as voice or telepathy, are not available. Conversions from Fahrenheit to Celsius or from Celsius to Fahrenheit are equally probable. So at some point, they can ask you to do, this, to do it this way and then another way. About 25% of the temperatures are negative. 
Um, although the digits are unpredictable and equally distributed, only 10% of the temperatures have integer values, such as 37 degrees. In other words, only 10% of the given temperatures are integer numbers, meaning that 90% are in the form of 36.68, for example. The numerical result must appear on the display. No other output methods are available. So you have to show it on the screen. You can't print it, you can't read it by voice or using some text-to-speech engine. Uh, <clears throat> you then read the result on the screen to the colleague who asks you about the conversion. The input and output fields must allow for at least 10 digits on each side of the decimal point. So you can have really large temperatures, 10 digits here, point, and then 10 digits beyond the floating point. Your job is to minimize the time it takes to the person working in the lab to perform these conversions. Uh, you can use the whole screen. You, can, you don't necessarily constrain yourself to a 10 by 20 pixel area on the screen. The whole screen is yours. You can use big letters, you can use big buttons, anything you can imagine. Uh, moreover, we can say that the input field so the window where all the action happens is already active. The focus is on that window. And you can begin typing, clicking, pointing, whatever you want. So you don't have to uh, calculate the time it takes for you to press start, programs, blah, 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 to run the program itself. The program is already on the screen, active, and waiting for your input. Um, so, that's it. One more thing. On average, you can assume that you will receive temperatures that require four typed characters, including the point the floating point itself, as well as the sign. So if it's minus 36.3, so that's minus 36, the point, ah, okay. So minus 3.5, minus 3.54. So on average, you usually get four characters for your input. And now, another assumption we make, which is unrealistic, but we make it, is that the person's typing skills are flawless. They will never press plus instead of minus. They always do the right thing. So take your time, think about it, and draw some sketches of an interface that solves this problem. In the meantime, I can... Uh, answer your questions before you start doing anything. So is it clear what needs to be done? Uh, is it needed to press plus in order to input uh, positive values? Or uh -huh. by Got it. Uh, well, this depends. In some interfaces, you might want to want the user to explicitly press plus. But we can just say that standard mathematical notation applies. If there is no sign in front of a number, we assume it's positive. If there is a sign, then it has to be a minus, so it's negative. What other clarifi clarifications do you think are necessary? Just sitting 
at his desk typing reports and his colleague is asking him different temperatures and he is running the program or the program is already running? The program is already running and you're not typing any reports. You are just a person optimized, highly trained for using this program for converting temperature units from one uh, and where he is typing his reports? You but said that. Yeah, but he is typing, but he is typing the reports and it's interrupted. Yeah, that was, uh, was like... Really? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Let's... <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Uh, the person operating the computer, the name is Hell. Hell works at a computer typing reports. He is occasionally interrupted by one or another of the researchers in the room and is asked to convert a temperature reading from degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius to degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit, respectively. But you see, if you are doing something else, then you can alt-tab between one window and another. I think it's better to just simplify that and assume that it's one person highly trained for converting temperatures using your super software. And 25% of the temperatures are negative? Uh, let's like go back. Yeah. 10% of temperatures are <laughs> integers. Integers. So 25% of the temperatures are negative. 10% of the temperatures are integers. Uh, one more thing. It is assume, assume that an average of four type characters will be entered, including the floating point and the sign. Like four for the floating point? Or no, a total of four characters, including the dot and the sign. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's see. I could bias you by giving you an example, but since you've asked. So let's say um, you have an interface which behaves in such a way that when you press the dot, it knows that there will be more. Oh, wait, it says you have to be able to accept up to 10 digits before and after the floating point. So the edit box has to be long enough if it's an edit box. It has to be long enough to allow 10 digits to be displayed here and 10 digits to be displayed here. So you cannot make it this short. You have to be able to see the whole number at once. That's what this is about. So I take all of the other words back. So. Yeah, the point of this exercise is to make uh, this, to optimize this process and to or to make him, or to make the person who works uh, <coughs> to take the mental load of his work or, or mm -hmm. what is the exact... Uh, so the objective is to design an interface that it enables HAL, our optimized, highly trained converter, to convert temperatures from Celsius to Fahrenheit and vice versa, as fast as possible. So we just have to present the interface? Yeah. And explain the how it works. And another point of this exercise is to compare your approaches. Somebody might say, I did this, and I guarantee that it's the fastest possible way to do this. And then we can measure it exactly using this model. And we can see if there's someone who can do it even faster than that. If such an option exists. So 
take five or maybe seven minutes to think about this. You can uh, devise several sketches, not just one. And then we'll compare your results. Well, you can pause it or, yeah, we'll be back in 10 minutes. <laughs> it's already live. Now everybody on this planet knows what you just said. Um, so everyone designed their own model for an interface that solves the problem we've discussed. Who thinks they have the fastest possible implementation? Mm -hmm. In an ideal case, I would ask some of you to go to the board and draw their interface and explain how it works. But that would imply that you have to walk there and make yourselves visible on this video, which may be a problem. So if you go for it, keep in mind that you will be on the tape. Um, once you've completed the sketch itself, use these figures here to compute um, how long it will take to convert 100 degrees Celsius into Fahrenheit using your interface. So give me a number and then we'll compare your numbers for this type of input. You are asked to convert 100 Celsius to Fahrenheit. How long will it take using your interface using these numbers here? So we have 1.95 seconds. Wow. Can anyone beat his result? But that just implies that he typed in the information and he got the result, like no other process happened. Like he got the result, that's it. Yes, okay. and everybody else operates in the same context. Irina, what's your We're computing? Computing. Okay. Is there anyone who got 42 seconds? How much? 42 seconds. No? Well, if you try really hard, yeah. I don't see why not. Yeah, you need to install Java, yeah. .NET Framework, Reboot. Uh, if we have a uh, shortcut, uh, is it, does it imply that we have to uh, mental... Uh, but the, the problem is already open. You don't think about it. Well, let's say you have a shortcut for choosing the uh, yeah. conversion direction. Yeah. So control C for this and Control F for that. Control C or F, just CF because it's easier and because so, there is a mental operation. You have to think what you're going to do. And then let's say you press two keys, control and then something else. So that's MKK. You don't have to have an M between the two keying operations. Okay, I know this, but I mean, uh, do, now we have to input the integer number or mm -hmm. the amount. Now we think again, do we add a number M? after the second K, or we yeah. don't uh, add one and just the keys, for example. Uh -huh. uh, I think 100 Celsius, and I press like C, then one, zero, zero. It means I think, then I press all the keys, or I think. So in this case, C 
is your command, yeah. and 100 zero zero is the argument for that command. Yeah. So there is, so this M is when you think about the argument. So yes, there has to be a mental operation when you give the argument to the command. Well, then you don't count what's not there. You count only what's there. No, because my scratch is like, I'm using uh, just the, the argument mm -hmm. is translating at the same time for both Faraday's and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, so if you input how many digits? Four. So 100, oh, three digits. So it's a mental operation, K, K, K. And do you press enter in the end? So that's, that's all. In your case, it will be 1.35 plus 3 multiplied by 0.2. Mm -hmm. And that's 195. Well, first of all, let's analyze someone's model that takes more than that. So we have one sample here and then another one there. Ready? about 4.4 uh, seconds. 4.4 seconds. Uh, are you interested in illustrating it here? Or you prefer to tell me and I do the drawing? Okay. Uh, it's better if you draw it and explain it in your words. I will play with the camera in the meantime. I'll put myself in your shoes. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> Two buttons. Uh, one of the buttons is to convert the input to sources, and another one is to uh, convert to mm -hmm. So, uh, what so if we're doing 100 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, then we have to write 100. So it's an M K K K. Then we have an M P Q. And what about homing? Is it a <coughs> button you press with the mouse? Yes. Or do you just... Uh, okay, we can use the tab uh -huh. to focus them. And mm -hmm. in this case we can have M, K, K for this one and M, K for this one. Mm -hmm. Or it's... Okay, if it's mouse, then we have uh, homing as well. To, to move mouse from here to here, for example. It's mm -hmm. homing. Yeah, that's a homing operation which costs yeah. 0.4 seconds. Isn't it pointing? Yeah, but before you can point, you have to move the hand okay, to the GID. Than, than HP. Okay. It's mouse. So uh, you saw the computation. Now, you could improve it by getting rid of the need to home and yes, point. Like you can press C, for example, to convert to Celsius, mm -hmm. and press F to convert to Fahrenheit. Yes, but if it's uh, focused here and we press F, it can take it as input. Mm -hmm. So we have to press and shift F, shift C, or control or out, mm -hmm. over the two buttons. So yeah, but you can also design your edit box in such a way that when it receives an F or a C, okay. it yeah. knows that, aha, uh -huh, now it's time for me to actually compute. But we can also remove this and but, merge this, and mm -hmm. the output will automatically convert like the model. Okay, so there is somebody else with a different approach. Uh, any volunteers? Or 
you can just use the existing sketch and uh, apply changes as necessary. It's going to be faster if I draw it because mine is very minimalistic. So yeah. <laughs> the true Unix way. <laughs> <laughs> it does one thing, but it does it damn well. So once the window is focused, that one automatically goes to Celsius. That's mm -hmm. this is it. It's uh, as Irina said, it automatically transforms. So as soon as you start tapping, it's going to give you the result. Uh huh. Well, That's one it works very nice for this example that I gave here, from Celsius to Fahrenheit. But what if the next challenge is to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius? Well, one of the one of the things is I guess you're going to have. In this case, it's, it was just MKKK, mm -hmm. luckily. If you have to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius, because it starts immediately at Celsius with its focus, you're going to have to press tab. You're going to have to think about it. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have to press tab. The moment you press tab, it switches to Fahrenheit, or it actually switches to the other one. Uh -huh. specific. So you can toggle the edit box by... Yeah. The cost is just one tab. Yeah, and it immediately... Um, um, uh, how do you call it when it takes all the elements of the text? Uh, the Captures the input? No, 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 no. When you... Select? Yeah, highlight. Yeah, it immediately, immediately selects all the text. So as soon as you start typing... It, uh, it types right. over. Yeah. So you don't have to press backspace no, a bunch of times. No, you the text. So it's going to add an MK. Mm -hmm. So this is an improvement of that. But we have a raised hand, which means there is another thing we can do. How? Oh, that's um, good. Uh, well, it's simple. For example, yeah, I think this is Irina's idea. I actually thought about it when. Uh, Before she did. No, <laughs> after, 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 it's uh, something like well, um, we have a field, just a field, where we type, for example, our number. And um, we can design our graphical user interface to be like below to appear. Um, to pieces of text, one saying, for example, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Celsius. Yeah, well, Celsius to Fahrenheit, or for example, 100 Celsius to Fahrenheit, and this is a uh, computer number. Mm -hmm. Or we can say 100, I, I mean, uh, another one which will say 100 uh, Fahrenheit, and this will be a mountain. Celsius. And Celsius. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This way so you basically add another field. Yeah. So, should I modify it or should I just leave my original? Like with the idea that was here. Yeah, you could modify it. Yeah, so basically add another field. Mm -hmm. And then this is going to be just the number, let's say n. And this is going to be the Celsius. And it's immediately going to give you two results, both Fahrenheit and Celsius. And in that case, yeah, we don't have to use a tab. Mm -hmm. The MK, the extra. You know. So, uh, we have together applied the keystroke level model to compare several different prototypes and conclude that, well, there was room for improvement. But, Dorin, you raised your hand. Uh -huh. You unraised it. Yeah, I, I would just wanted to ask Irina, is this yeah. was your idea? Yeah, was my idea. Okay, okay. So, this is what mm -hmm. I But we have another. Uh, no, I just wanted to say something to this idea. Doesn't this add noise in the what we want to see because we put some integer that means that uh, this integer in the Fahrenheit label uh, it will convert to Celsius to Fahrenheit and the Celsius label it will convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. Mm -hmm. So th which means that we type something and we get some result that we actually don't need. Is it? Yeah, I understand. So let me adjust it a little bit. So the suggested model is you have just one input field. And as you type, it computes the result in real time. And here you have, let's say, something like this. It has Celsius 45, Fahrenheit 97. So now you have the mental task of deciding 
Do you need this number or this number? Is that what you yeah. brought up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So indeed, it makes sense that now we challenge the person with making a choice. Yeah, but you see, in, in the previous sketches we've discussed, um, you only had one result. Oh, yes, but so you, you didn't have to... You have to input the... Uh, yeah, but you know that this is the input. So obviously the answer is anything except this. And there was only one figure to look at. In this example, we have two, so we have to make a choice. And in this case, we can rely on habituation again. Um, you can just get used to the fact, after using this software for 10 years, you will know that Celsius is on the left and Fahrenheit degrees are on the right. And in this case, you will have this hardware acceleration, a bunch of neurons telling you specifically that Celsius is to the left and Fahrenheit is on the right. So habituation is a, is a benefit you get as time goes by. Of course, if you keep randomly changing their places or putting it here and then sometimes there, then you will not be able to leverage habituation as a feature. But if these positions are constant, then you are good to go. So that's my comment to your remark. And we can also try it from a different angle. Um, so let's say you, in this model, you have the mental operation in the beginning, then you typed 100 as the input figure, so that's k, k, k. Then you look at the result and you have to make a choice. Is it this one or that one? So there's another M. Now, if you look here, the cost of a mental operation is 1.35. But we can also take a different path and make it another K. I press C for one and F for the other. And in that case, I only pay 0.2 seconds, which is less than that. But this last K, ah, indeed, you're right. Because this K is an argument, mm -hmm. so there is a mental operation before that. You beat me. Yes, that's right. Actually, th this was a trick statement. <laughs> I wanted you to catch me making this mistake. So uh, remember, habituation is really a big deal. You have to make the interface uh, consistent. If you keep changing it, then you will break whatever neurons and neural paths people developed in their brains after using the software. So um, this is what I wanted to tell you about the keystroke level modeling technique. It's really simple and it gives you quick results. And it allows you to filter the not so good models from the slightly better ones and there is one more step we have to make um, to further squeeze everything we can out of this, which brings us to another matter that I will only briefly discuss today. Mm -hmm. And that's information efficiency. It's something we'll discuss tomorrow, but as a preview, um, I will tell you a few things about this. 
it's a method that enables us to answer questions such as what's the best theoretical result we can get for the models we've had here. So uh, you, you've read the challenge about uh, temperature conversions. This is what the interface has to do. We designed one model, then another one, then another one, and we got this result, that one, and then maybe something else. And let's say that today we have empirically established that this was the best result we could possibly get. Now, my next question is, is there a way to make a certain statement that there is nothing we can do to make it even better than 1.95? Maybe there is. What we did today is we've designed several models, we've compared them, and we chose the best one from the three we've had. But we don't really know if it's the best one there could possibly be in this entire universe. Make sure you, no, 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 no. Let's not invade their privacy. They already pay the cost by not learning about the keystroke level model. But they will, of course, go to the website and watch the video. And <laughs> did anyone watch at least one of the videos we recorded? OK. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK, well, that's better than I expected. Um, but we will leave that for tomorrow because I need to think about sample exercises that will be better for illustrating the concept. And because this involves some math. And that's not my uh, strongest point. So, and this will probably be the last um, topic in the context of user experience, user interfaces, and human computer interaction for this course. Yeah. Uh, you just. Uh -huh. um, so today we will have a discussion that is also about software design, but it's not about interfaces any longer. It's about something completely different. I erase it specifically so they don't get any, any material. <laughs> <laughs>